All right. Ta-da, we're on Facebook. Hi, Facebook. I'm Jonathan Haupt, Executive Director of our nonprofit Pat Conroy Literary Center here in Beaufort. Having a bit of technical difficulties with this month's open mic, but uh, that's how you know it's Zoom. So we are now live and excited to once again host an open mic night. Our featured writer tonight uh, is Casey Whitener, who will be closing out the show. But we're going to start tonight with our returning friend, Niles Reddick. So Niles, you are up first, sir. Thank, thanks, um, Jonathan. And I, I actually have two pieces, but uh, how much time do we have? I, one of them 600 words and one of them 700 words. They're very short pieces. You have 1,300 words worth of time. Oh, okay. Well, um, I'll read the, these are new pieces. And so if you have any, any uh, comments or opinions, I'd love to hear them. Um, they, I haven't sent them off yet, but the first one is uh, titled Thirst. Uh, these are both stories that are actually California-based stories uh, from a trip there this summer. And so Thirst, the homeless man stood on the corner just up from the Santa Monica Pier by the triple water fountain that rested atop a column decorated with sea blue tile. He smiled, showing a set of mostly white teeth. He only wore tattered shirt shorts and the bottoms of his feet were filthy and revealed uncared for sores. His hair was unkipped and had formed dreadlocks that fell below his ears. He had a small paper cup in his right hand, filled it from one of the fountains and then tossed the water onto different pavement squares on the sidewalk. We were in the souvenir store in search of magnets, coffee cups, and nice t-shirts. And while they shopped, I watched him from the storefront window and could hear him through the open doors. Okay, he asked toward the sidewalk. I wasn't sure to what he referred. I've got some blunts, you want one? He asked a man coming out of the store, but the man ignored him. One child wanted a drink, but the mother didn't want to get close. I'm thirsty, he whined and tugged at his mother's blouse. We can wait, the mother said. No, I want to drink now. We'll get an ice cream. Okay, let's go. I learned from the security guard near the door that the homeless man went by Sam and lived in a tent just down from Santa Monica on Venice Beach. He combed the sands daily in search of treasures on his pilgrimage from Venice Beach to the Santa Monica Pier and back. He had a high school diploma, had gone to a community college, but dropped out when he couldn't pay back loans. His already elderly parents couldn't help him. And when his mother died and his father lost the house, they both camped in an abandoned Winnebago on the road shoulder until they were herded to Skid Row in Los Angeles, an already sprawling 50 city block homeless camp. They had been there for 90 years since the 1930s. The guard explained that finally a tough, love, a tough love judge had called for audits of charities and government entities in order to fund established house and care for the homeless once and for all. Sam and his father headed to Venice Beach, but his father fell into the cactus garden in Beverly Hills, got infection and died. Sam ended up following the tarot card reader to Venice Beach shortly after and together they scooped enough coins and bills in their hat from her readings and his dancing to outdated music to eke enough food to survive day to day. She told him she was going to Malibu one day and he never saw her again. What little he'd made from panhandling, he'd bought food and legal marijuana and stayed high most of the time. What's he doing with the water? He's feeding the gremlins. What? He thinks there are gremlins following him around and they are thirsty. Gremlins like the ones in the movies? Yeah, they were manufactured Hollywood creatures in the movies. He tossing water for them to lick off the pavement. The water evaporates and it reinforces that they're lapping it up. That's nuts. Well, to him, it's real. I suspect he smoked some stuff that probably sent him further over the edge. He's harmless though. I can't give him a lot, but occasionally I give him a few bucks. It seemed to me that like most Americans, I was one paycheck away from being like Sam. And because I wasn't like Sam, I needed to help in some small way. I walked outside. Hey, Sam, he turned toward me 
but continued to fill the cup and toss the water on the pavement. I handed him a $50 bill and he put it in his pocket and continued to help his gremlins quench their thirst. The 50 probably wouldn't help him much or even for long, but I walked to feeling like it was the right thing to do. Ooh, nice. That's really fiction. Not an American story. Mm. I was amazed by the um, the gravity of the homeless situation in Los Angeles when I was there, and I left there thinking that I can't believe that they've had this massive homeless situation since the 1930s. I mean, you talk about politics and everybody talks a good game, but really, no party does anything <laughs> to get rid of it and help these people um, at least enough that it would clear it all up. But hopefully there's uh, some new stuff going on in LA that will help. The next one is called um, titled Madame Tussauds. It's about the uh, wax museum. I hope you uh, enjoyed this one. Uh, one of the first, first wax models Madame Tussaud made was when, she, when the famous French writer Voltaire modeled for her. Recognized for her artistic abilities, she taught votive making to King Louis the 16th sister Elizabeth and even lived at Versailles for several years. The museum brochure read that her legend lived on in wax museums across the globe, but we didn't want to spend nearly $150 to see the wax figures of famous people and characters conjured by Hollywood. When we couldn't score free tickets to the Ellen DeGeneres show or the Jimmy Kimmel Live, we decided to splurge and visit the wax museum anyway because of our son who pleaded he could get pictures with Aquaman, Spider-Man, Superman, heroes to him from comic books, cartoons, films, and more recently, Xbox games. Making our way down the Star Walk of Fame, we had to step over a homeless woman sleeping next to the star of Lois Lane from Superman. I'd read about movie stars who lost it all, and had become homeless like Margot Kidder, who played Lois Lane, mm -hmm. Dana Bonnie Ducci, who was in the Partridge family, Brett Butler, who played in Grace Under Fire, and even Willie Ames, Eight is Enough. And fortunately, their lives turned around and they survived. We also had to fend off tour salesmen, a woman who could create a star in the sidewalk for tourists, people dressed like Freddy Krueger, Batman, and even Mickey Mouse. I ride like a star for Ferrari tour up Mulholland Drive and vendors selling foods and drinks. We felt like fish swimming upstream, but the fading sun and lights from Griffith Observatory shone bright on the infamous Hollywood hillside sign. We bought our ticket, tickets masked up and we were, encur were encouraged to take plenty of photos. We were exhausted from walking miles from our hotel to see various tourist attractions, to eat at famous restaurants like In-N-Out and Fat Sal's, and from jet lag from losing three hours from Eastern to Pacific time. So we blinked several times to make certain the wax figures were indeed wax. They seemed even more real than the people, the real people seemed on TV, whether it was historical figures who were no longer living like our Audrey Hepburn from Breakfast at Tiffany's, Patrick Swayze from Dirty Dancing, or Clark Gable from Gone with the Wind. Clothing, hair, expressions, and even eyes seemed perfect, as if they had been simply stopped and were preserved in time. There were moments when I felt like the wax figures might be watching us, as if their eyes followed us around the room, and several times I walked back just to double check. I took photos with Tom Hanks as Forrest Gump on the park bench with his box of chocolates on his lap. Patrick Stewart, who played Jean-Luc Picard on Star Trek The Next Generation from the captain's chair on the bridge of the USS Enterprise, and even with E.T. in a basket on a bicycle. And my photos seemed as real as the shows and films I had watched. Suddenly, I had gone from the sidelines of our living room to front and center. When we got to the second floor and found other wax stars, our amazement didn't fade. And as I stood next to the iconic Betty White, I heard, hey there. 
I know my eyes opened wide and my wife said, come on, smile, get closer to her, maybe give her a kiss on the cheek. Yeah, baby, give it to me. I turned and looked at her and her eyes glistened. What are you doing, my wife asked. I thought I heard something. Hurry up, I still want a picture with me and Marlon Brando. I always wanted to play Stella in the school play, but that slut Stephanie got the part. <laughs> I, I want Jack Nicholson too, she said. I turned back, smiled, and then I felt it. Someone pinched me on the ass. Betty had the same look on her face as if she had done nothing, and I turned around. There were no other tourists near the exhibit. Do you think there are actors playing the part of wax figures, I asked? <laughs> How many Xanax did you take for the six-hour cross-country flight, she responded. I only took two. How many were you supposed to take? I can take up to two per day. Per day, but not together, right? <laughs> well, no wonder you're so damn loopy. Come on. As we walked out, I turned back and Betty White winked at me. I smiled and blew her a kiss. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wonderful. Um, great, great story. Great story. <laughs> so well laid. Oh, that's any, great. any feedback on those two? <laughs> Uh, I liked them. Like them both. They were Thanks. great. Great, great stories. Yeah. I think we need more Betty White cameos and open mic just as a rule. I think that, uh, that's a requirement from this month on. <laughs> <laughs> great. Yeah. Right. Niles, that is my wife's nightmare, by the way. She does not like it when, quote, uh, wax thinks it's people, end quote. So. <laughs> Well, they really are. I'd never been in a wax museum until we went there and they were incredible. It was really incredible. Yeah. Um, it was worth the money. <laughs> but I swear I thought she was, she looked real. Uh, I mean, she was even more real. And I thought at one point there, these have to be people playing the part. I mean, it's Hollywood, right? Yeah. So it had to be real people playing these roles, but I guess they were really wax. With $150? It was expensive, yeah. $150? Well, for all of us. It, there oh, were four okay. of us, and so mm -hmm. I think it was 40 or 50 a piece, something like that. Yeah, I, know. I have to make a note of that. Yeah. <laughs> Very shocked, Niles, if somebody doesn't pick up that wax museum one. Yeah. We published that. We'll see. I thought with Betty White, it had to be. It had to. <laughs> And we'll always wonder who pinched your ass. That's right. We'll always that. <laughs> That's not really characteristic of my writing either, by the way. <laughs> when you when you're in your fifties, you don't write stuff like that anymore, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah, you do. <laughs> out of the way, so I will take that as a sign that she is ready to read. So I'm uh, sure. Thank you. Yes. Um, so what I want to read tonight, the first part of it is historical. So it was really great to hear Niles talk a lot about history and um, his pieces. So the first part is historical. And then the second part is my reaction to history. So it's fictional, the second part. And um, since this is October, I think it fits. And it's titled Sir William's Pumpkin Park. William Phipps was the 21st child in a handsome brood of 26. He was born on February 2nd, 1651 in the settlement of Monswiag on the coast of what is today the state of Maine. William's father was a gunsmith and farmer. His mother, a homemaker, served her 26 hungry children milk and baked pumpkin for nourishment during the cold winters. Phipps grew to become a shipbuilder, a sailor, treasure hunter, and a governor. When he was successful in finding sunken treasure, King James II knighted Phipps and awarded him governorship of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. It was then that Sir William Phipps was confronted with a plague of witchcraft infecting his territory. Sir William, after much political and social influence, created the court of Oyer and Terminer, this special panel of judges ruled on the cases against the accused witches and wizards in the historic Salem witch trials. The accusers would inherit the land and wealth of those they condemned. 
Oh, wow. In two, and yeah, in two short years, 21 men and women were found guilty of witchcraft and were executed or died of starvation awaiting trial. When the masses turned on Mary Hull Phipps, Sir William's wife, and accused her of witchcraft, the governor then abolished the special court and freed the imprisoned. Sir William Phipps died of influenza at the age of 44 in England. He is buried at the church of St. Mary Walnut in the city of London. Or is he? Sir William's Pumpkin Park. I woke up late one Salem Eve, <clears throat> excuse me, and rubbed the sleep against my sleeve and saw beyond the black of night a pulsing glow of hazed orange light. I stumbled past the edge of dark to find Sir William's pumpkin park. Sir William lives, I knew it so, that Salem governor of long ago. Flickering faces blazed my path, so I crept in and felt his wrath. Sir William, old and cursed with age, carved orange faces with fevered rage. Skin and flesh and seed spun wild, bewitching a grin, his gruesome smile. He charmed my want to fathom his art, and William's pulse suddenly beat in my heart. Twenty-one orange heads moaned in fear until he stabbed their eye sockets clear. Jack-o'-lanterns batted for sight and flashed at me with cursed delight. Their gifted voices roused the dead. I crooned the pumpkin words they said. Slice us up to give us life. Wake twenty-one souls with a carving knife. Scrape our seeds and torch our light. Hail innocent wishes, witches on Halloween night. Sir William glared and screamed with rage while his skeletal face lost its age. His cape of bats broke up, took flight. He grabbed my throat with spectral might. Sir William was I. I let me go and watched me run from my distant shadow. Out of breath, gulping smooth dark, while a curious moonlight mused my heart. I crouched beside a silvery pool that mirrored my haunt, so sinful and cruel. Bewitched, I said, willow the wisp, governor, I am. I am Sir William Phipps. I moaned with witches, howling quite ghoulish, danced with ghosts, felt wicked and foolish. How could I forget my fate unseen, sitting upon the throne of Halloween? I am Sir William, I knew it so. I doomed 21 witches so long ago. Haunted by them, I die to live for countless years. Salem won't forgive. From old to young and young to old, I carve these dreaded pumpkins of gold. Slice us up to give us life. Wake 21 souls with a carving knife. Scrape our seeds and torch our light. Hail innocent witches on Halloween night. Next year, I'll relive these wretched deeds, but first, I'll plant new pumpkin seeds. Make this curse stop, I plead and yell. I can't unring the witch's death bell. The laughter of the condemned rings my ear. The witches impose vengeful fear. One year of days and sparkling dark to swell the fruit of Sir William's pumpkin park. The last seed is buried and ripe to grow as dawn overtakes the amber glow. I can't seem to recall this hallowed eve as I run rub my bony brow upon my sleeve. I curl into bed, deep soil dark with bugs and worms to feed pumpkin park. My blanket of bats warm my mound as roots pulse my lullaby sounds. Slice us up to give us life. Wake 21 souls with a carving knife. Scrape our seeds and torch our light. Hail innocent witches on Halloween night. This, wonderful. Um, thank you. This came out in 2011 um, with uh, nice. uh, in an anthology. We should be embarrassed, but we're not from Writers One Flight Up uh, anthology. So I'm, I'm so honored to be in this. So thank you for the oh, honor to read. I love that piece. Uh -huh. And I, I just want to add that uh, my 10th great grandmother is Rebecca Nurse, one of the women who was executed as a witch. Oh in my God. Whoa. And her um, husband, had been in a land deal with the judge and the judge felt like he was on the losing side of that deal. So how do you suppose that impacted Rebecca? Oh my goodness. Wow. Goosebumps. I have. Goosebumps. I think that's where some of my sense of fair play and um, <laughs> uh, uh, the strong mm -hmm. social conscience comes from. Yeah. Yeah. 
Oh, it's Enjoy wonderful, it. Lisa. Oh, thank you. I thank you. Love yep. it. Yep. Yeah. McLean's book took <clears throat> is in development. Um, is on the theme of people being a person being declared insane, mm. so that they acquire her land for the Savannah River site right here in South Carolina. See, oh a, my goodness, it's a, it's a stirring story. So the 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 chicanery that goes on to get other people's property is is just extreme that the witches was mostly about that from what you're saying right yeah. right yeah, yeah i wrote that down about the uh, land being inherited i i like that i mean it's very very interesting to me well with that piece i wrote pumpkin park and i didn't have my main character so i actually flew to boston went to salem and found sir william phipps Ooh. in the court the actual court where the uh witch trials took place so, wow. um, so it's interesting that it, it went the other way, yeah. you know, because I had the pumpkin park story, but I didn't have my main character. So, uh, that nice. added that dimension to it. Yeah. Kind of backwards. Nice. Nice. Yeah, but thank you. Thank you for letting me. Thank you. Excellent. Wonderful. Very good. Definitely the right month for that. So yes, exactly. yes. I kept thinking of Edgar Allan Poe through the whole thing. Ooh. Oh, lovely. Barry, that's wonderful. I love Edgar Allan Poe. I was As thinking do I. McElroy because he's next. <laughs> uh, and just to forewarn our next group, uh, after Mac reads, it'll be Susan, Jane, and then Barry. Well, I uh, hi Jonathan. I, am I on? I am. You are. Yes, sir. I promise not to trespass for more than about three minutes, but I do want to add a little bit more to the setup than I planned. Uh, and all, uh, some of you may know my first book, uh, my only book, well, not exactly rocket scientists and other stories. And I got thinking, really, uh, you might find this somewhat more interesting than the rest of us, because it's a, it's a look back when three, three uh, fellows look at their crazy boyhoods back in the 1950s and 1960s. And some of you may, you, you may know when I read it, when I wrote the book, my granddaughter said, when you tell those stories with your friends, it seems like it was a simpler time. Now, I, I don't know about that. I just read a great quote from someone that the good old days may simply be a function of a bad memory. So that may be more of what's going on there. But, but uh, Millie, these were stories about kids growing up through about 12th grade. The sequel imaginatively called, not exactly rocket scientists, a totally unnecessary sequel, begin at the end of high school and go the next decade. So I will trespass on your time uh, and give just a little bit of what may be the first chapter or the forward. Uh, two things I ask you to think about. Number one, this is a partially a love uh, letter to New Jersey. Now, I don't know how many times you've heard that down here. It talks about Jersey, where I was from, and it may have a little bit of a message for all of us as writers. So here it goes, from the foreword. If you read our first book, you know the takeaway was obvious. Kids grow up, and we tried. It just didn't take. And we were left, you, our few readers, we were just a senior prom away from graduating high school. So we need to wrap that up before we move forward. The event was held off campus at a Jersey swanky hotel which has its own relative metrics, but it had the overall look and whiff of good taste, a nice change from the Friday fish stick aroma of the school cafeteria where our soft hop had been held, or the brightly painted basketball lines on the gymnasium dance floor where a junior prom had been held. And after the prom, a bunch of us drove down the Jersey shore to Mantaloking to watch the sunrise. It was a night of breathtaking, billion stars in the sky and a show that many people think New Jersey just But it did that night as it had so many times, many of us before. Soft sand tickled our feet, the taste of salt floating in the gentle breeze. Scratchy old blankets around a driftwood campfire, even the least poetic of us Feel the tug of things unknown, a feeling that the bubble was about to pop. We knew the wizard behind the curtain was waiting for us out there somewhere, but he had to wait. 
little longer. There are some moments in every life that are hard to beat. This was one. We shared some of the stories you, have met, you may have read in our first book, while others were private then, and they're going to remain so. Our readers have asked often how we make those choices, how we talk about in a memoir, and some hope, how do we, some ask, we hope the question is not asked, but they ask each of us, why did we write? Why did we write at all? Maybe it's, maybe it's as simple as wanting, maybe even needing, scratch something in the sand, something that says, I was here. With the muffled sound of the low rollers of the surf, indifferent to all of us then, and to those who have come before, and to those who will follow, we could feel at least under those stars something of what Lily Pomlin said a few years later. We're all in this alone. But that night we were not alone. The faces lit, those faces lit by the fire told us that our friendships and our shared stories then, and maybe our written stories now, were exactly that scratch in the sand that we needed, a buffer against something. I was here, and so were you. And Very nice. We're oh. all in alone. Oh my goodness. That, that was a that was a Lily Tomlin. Wow. I always thought it was Woody Allen. I had to research that. Hmm. It was a beautiful night, by the way. Yeah. But Lily yeah. was there. Yeah. I don't even know whether they have junior proms and soft hops. It, it's such a different world, you know. And old guys like to look back sometimes. That's what our books. Hawk <laughs> hop. Beautiful. Uh -huh. I haven't thought about a sock hop in a long time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, honestly, Mac, if you start with this is a love letter to New Jersey, we literally have no idea what's going to happen next. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's usually about anything I write. Who knows? <laughs> thanks, thanks for indulging me on that. Wonderful. Yeah. wonderful. Right. Right. And Millie's going, sock hop? What's a yeah, sock Yeah, I was going to say, I, 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 you know, those things actually happen. Absolutely no clue what that was. That yeah. Don't know what that but, is. I mean, I, I don't want to go into this too deeply, but oh my gosh, that time seems like a universe ago. I and mean, we actually went to the, we danced in our socks yeah. on a gymnasium floor so the all over the country. Blue. Everybody yeah. wore loafers. Not just New Jersey. Yeah. Everybody yeah. wore loafers. Oh, that's right. Oh, so you could yeah. take your shoes and you could take, and you could take them off. Yeah. So, right. the, so the janitor didn't have to wax the floor. That's out. right. Yeah, oh yeah, you absolutely couldn't wear your shoes on the gym <laughs> floor. That was like forbidden. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Matt. John. That was great. Okay. Um, Take it, Susan, please. All right. November 14th, 2008. Into Africa I fly on a one-way ticket. The journey through 14 countries in 22 months on local transportation. Learn, rest, change. A woman among men without advantage of youth or money. The journey has many pieces. December 25th, 2008. Carowin, holy city of Tunisia, fourth holiest of Islam. Pilgrimage. My steps slowly swim sanctity in half-lit marble archways of the great mosque on Christmas day. Memories doggedly trail me through this holy place that ignores the birth of baby Jesus. Vistas inside my head mix reindeer, snowmen, and elves with ancient pagan carvings of vines, trees, and flowers. Bell-like chants call Muslims to pray, warm the air like aroma, echo a high mass chorus in my mind. Crowds bustle to the prayer hall, wrapped in black. I'm still not allowed inside, but watch from the door purposely left open for observation by none Muslims like me. High dome windows glisten silver ribbons of natural light. Men and women kneel widely separated 
shoulder to shoulder, feet to feet, church faces resting on white marble floor turned southeast to Mecca, birthplace of Islam a thousand miles away. Voices chord like a church organ, worship Muhammad as a final prophet of God. After prayer, the flagstone courtyard, a fuzzy crush of Arabs whirl my black robe like a Christmas toy, round up for fun. We weave toward the gate to leave the mosque. A man in white robes leans forward to my ear. He whispers, Merry Christmas. Out of the gate, my feet walk in time in holy madness of ringing bells in my head. Religious musings turn somersaults, jam my mind. Baby Jesus, kneeling white robes, Santa on the roof, Muhammad the prophet. My heated thoughts on high religion are interrupted. Tones of Ella Fitzgerald bounce off a sunlit wall. Her scat blasts from a sidewalk cafe on the wide corner in front of me. I take a seat. A grinning Arab in jeans strides to the table. You like jazz? Absolutely. He straddles the back of his chair. My name is Omar. I own this cafe. We talk Ella Fitzgerald, Billie Holiday, Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington. Louis wails trumpet around us. Billy croons. Omar treats me to a liver sandwich stuffed with French fries. Liver is the meat of choice in Tunisia. All food in Tunisia is stuffed with French fries. Delicious. We talk high noon, sunset boulevard, rear window on the waterfront. Omar brings tea. We talk religion. I stir honey into my tea. Bells are everywhere in the mosque. Christians love bells. He nods. Muhammad describes his revelations were sometimes like the ringing of a bell. What do you think about the angels? Christian angels? Omar chuckles. No, Islamic angels. Muslim believes, Muslims believe each human has an angel to record personal behavior. My thoughts race to Gabriel with Mary in the garden. Why are angels on a blazing Christmas tree? Afternoon yawns, sun begins to set on Christmas day. A Muslim call goes out for prayer. I smile. Each religion believes it has the only God, which is the same God with many voices. Each looks out of the land of Nod, east of Eden, worships God in hallowed space. Let all the angels sing. Oh, wow. Wow. Excellent. Wonderful ending. <laughs> Wonderful ending. Uh, fabulous ending. Yeah. Susan, was the liver really good? Is liver yeah, ever it is. Good? It's excellent. <laughs> you know, you know, in countries like Egypt and and uh, Tunisia, they eat all the they like lizard all the insides. They're always eating the insides of. Uh, I think it comes from being mummies or something. <laughs> <laughs> you know what they do? That's that's their meat. You know that's how they eat. <laughs> To say, the beautiful, Susan, beautiful story, beautiful. Yes, yeah. and Susan oh, makes you. Africa alive for all of us. It's uh, we've really yeah. enjoyed listening to your stories so much. Thank you. Well, it really beautifully shows the clash of the two cultures and you know the mixing of it. I, I loved your phrase about the um, the echoes of a high mass qu chorus, the cries that you hear from them are mm -hmm. really like an echo of the high mass choir. Well, so you, you find when parallel. you're there, you know, that that it all kind of blends together if, mm -hmm. you know, um, in the different countries because people are people no matter what, you know, so. Right. Thank you, beautifully read, Susan. Jane, are you ready to go next? Thank you, Jonathan. I'm ready. Tonight I'm reading an excerpt from uh, my, my Boston novel, To the Next Home Run. And in this scene, um, a widow, Mary Margaret Rourke, 
is at home at night, spending a long night by herself, um, going through yearbooks and just passing the time until her son comes home. Her son is a grown man who's moved back home with mama after his wife has uh, thrown him out. Okay, so this is how it begins. After a final glance at Dennis Sr.'s picture, Mary Margaret closed the yearbook, grimacing as she recalled how his once brilliant smile had begun to fade at the sight of her. <clears throat> Went from being his trophy to being his ball and chain by the time I was 21. Ha! The abrupt sound of her own bitter laugh startled her from her own reverie. This time, the sound was unmistakable. Jimmy's off key singing in the jangle of his keys at the front door. <clears throat> she stood, snapped off the flame under the kettle and hustled to the small keeping room off the kitchen where she'd had Jimmy install a single bed for her after the funeral. She knew Jimmy hated to find her waiting up for him and she hated getting caught. Throwing back the bedclothes, she groaned as she laid down and pulled the covers tight to her chin, just as her son lumbered into the kitchen. Ma, Ma, anybody around here to rustle up a midnight breakfast for a hard working guy? She called out, oh, Jimmy, I'm in bed. I must have nodded off. He tripped over a kitchen chair crossing to her bedroom door. She called out again, stay there, stay there. I'll be right out. Let me get something on. Clambering out of bed, she threw a robe over her clothes, belted it and appeared in the doorway, disheveled and breathless. Eggs the way you usually like them, hun? He flashed a rakish, sleepy-eyed grin at her, left hand grasping a kiss kitchen chair for balance, his right hand offering a single limp red rose encased in cellophane, the kind they sell in bars late at night. Her heart skipped a beat. Mother of God, she thought, was that the arrhythmia? Or did he just make me think of my dentist when we were young? Make me some of those eggs, Ma, the way you used to, for da. She smiled. If you'll put that rose in some water, it makes me sad to see a living thing wilt. She trudged to the fridge, grabbed eggs, boiled potatoes and bacon, and shuffled back to the stove. In the lower cabinet, she felt around for her best cast iron pan, the weight tearing at her shoulder as it came off the shelf. Holding it in both hands for a long moment, she relived a certain evening when the back of her husband's head became a mighty temptation. Took a lot of Hail Marys that night, she thought. With effort, she heaved the frying pan onto the stove and lit the gas burner, glancing sidelong at her son. After the bacon and potatoes crisp, she cracked the eggs into the pan and stood transfixed, watching them transform from clear to opaque before her eyes. Like my boys, she thought. One day, easy to see through. Next day, you have no idea who they are anymore. She exhaled a deep sigh and mused aloud, how does anyone raise kids? What are you mumbling, Ma? Nothing, Jimmy, nothing. She, she scooped the food onto his plate and laid it in front of him, adding two paper napkins and a bottle of ketchup to the side. I think it's a good thing you came back home for right now. It's been sort of lonely here since your da passed. You kind of get used to having a man around, even if, well, you just get used to a man. Jimmy grunted, his mouth full. That's it. It's about three minutes. <laughs> and I've always said this when I hear you. I love your 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 dialect. And <laughs> really, I mean, I just I just love how that puts us right where we need to be. I mean, this gets better and better and better. It needs to be. Jane, Jane, you don't you don't write in that dialect, do you? Yeah. You don't. Yes, I do. you yes. do. Yeah, it's That's what makes it really cool when you yeah. read it. Yeah. Yeah. I've had some editors that have a problem with that, but I don't care. That's the way it's written. So yeah. It's going to be written. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. I, I felt her shoulder with that big pan. 
<laughs> I, I understood more than anything the, uh, the opaque um, eggs going from translucent to opaque and people as children uh, making that transition too for their parents. So, I mean, there were a lot of things that really spoke to me in that piece. It was lovely. Okay. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. It's, um, is that naked realism, Casey? <laughs> Um, pro probably not quite dirty enough, but yeah. <laughs> but it's realistic, very realistic. It'll get dirty later, yeah. <clears throat> very well, good. You don't have a 17 year old in the Zoom room for that part. How about? Oh, that? yes, no, no, we have to keep it clean here. <laughs> That's the I Zoom in it. Anyway, so I mean. Um, thank you so much for having me tonight. It was really wonderful to hear you all read. Thank you Thanks for coming. It's Millie. lovely to meet you. Lovely to meet, nice you too. to meet you too. Thank Bye. you for sharing your story. I didn't have anything to share, but thank you oh. for sharing yours. No, you shared your story, though, the story, your personal story. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. And also about the schools, I just happened to see a headline that three teachers were injured at May River High School yesterday. Oh, Dude, there's lots going on in the schools in uh, South Carolina yeah. right now. It's going mm -hmm. great. We oh, need to be paying attention. Yeah. Stay safe out there, Millie. Make Stay your safe. choices. Yes, yeah, ma'am. Thank you. Welcome. Bye. Bye. Yeah. That's so sad to hear. Yeah. 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 Oh. Gary. Yes. Would you like to light? <laughs> What's that? Would you like to lighten the mood with a reading? Uh, not this one's not going to lighten it too much, I don't oh. think. Go that direction then. All right. <laughs> what do you got for us? Um, so let's see. You've all heard me read a bunch of poems from my collection, maybe today, from Cherry Grove Collections, which I'll hold up and get a plug for. <laughs> um, and I've read from my uh, collection of micro memoirs, a lot of the shorter ones here. I've tried to stay under three minutes and a couple of months ago I began to read to have the 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 chutzpah to read the ones that are a little over three minutes and I have quite a few of those that, that I have never read here in this group and this is one of them this the name of the collection is Barry who 33 unforgettable micro memoirs from someone you never heard of <laughs> and it's just little incidents from my life unrelated to each other and they all come with a date and they're true stories this one is summer 1955 the title is something deeper race was never discussed in my house nobody taught me to hate nobody taught me not to it just never came up when I walked out the front door into the world, I carried an attitude towards such matters that came from, well, tell you the truth, I don't know where it came from. I knew it was there though, on that day in 1955. There was one black family, let's call them the Parsons, in that little Pennsylvania village, population 7,000, 6,993 Caucasians. A bunch of us kids were playing in a field, running, laughing, tossing a ball, you know, being kids. After a while, another kid approached on his bike, Walter Parsons. I had seen him whizzing around town on that bike before. I would always be sure to wave. Decades later, I can distinctly remember the actual feeling. I wanted him to see that I was friendly to him. I felt surely he was coming to join us. Why not? He was approximately our age, around two years older than I. And besides, a couple more kids and we could maybe choose up teams for a baseball game. As he got closer though, what started was no game. Oh, geez, look who it is, said Danny. Let's hide, said Tommy. Hide? Why would we hide? Besides, I thought, where the heck do you hide in the middle of a field? Behind each other? The first to speak directly to him was Carl. What do you want? 
be called out. What do you want? Who asks a kid what they want when he arrives at a bunch of other kids? The kids that would give Walter his nickname, that's who. Hey, Snowball, yelled Danny, several in the group laughing. I'm not going to even try to guess what Walter felt, but I know what I felt. Like someone stabbed me. Jesus Christ, I thought. These guys are cruel. Nah, hey, uh, come on over. I kind of sort of yelled, waving him toward us. Nah, hey, stay away, yelled Ralphie, waving him away. There's nobody here, Danny added. The same ones laughed again. Come on, let him alone, said Jake. He has a right to be here. An ally. Now I felt emboldened. Come on over. This time I yelled with confidence. Yeah, come on, Katie added. Looks like teams were forming, just not baseball teams. At this point, Walter was still sitting on his bike, one foot on the ground for balance. He just stared at us. About 10 seconds passed during which nobody said a word. Him, us, total silence. Then out of nowhere, Walter smiled. He sat on his bike, looked us over and smiled. I can tell you I will never forget that smile. A second or two later, he pushed off with his foot and slowly rode away, casually weaving a little left, a little right, looking around as if nothing had happened as he pedaled up the street. That was it. The incident was over. Now, there are many angles to analyze this from. Civil rights, Yankee hypocrisy, peer pressure, etc. Right now, I'll leave that to those who've been hashing this out for centuries and will be for more centuries. Here's what I want to know. What makes one kid one way and another kid another way? Why did Danny, Tommy, Carl, and Ralphie feel what they felt, but Jake, Katie, and I feel what we felt? I know all about the attitudes are learned theory, of course. But remember, nobody taught me anything here. And guess what? Ralphie and Jake are brothers. Somebody, please explain this to me. Thank you. I love it. Uh, That's a great story, Barry. Thank you. Yeah, perfect. Very complex. I've heard it before and it makes yeah. my heart flutter. Yeah. 1955, yeah. huh? 1955. Yep. Still going on. Yep. yep. Uh, Barry, are you getting getting some traction on getting that? Uh, your Barry who idea has to get published. Is that? Um, it's out there, and I've gotten a lot of inter interesting yeah. response. It's such such great stuff. Mm -hmm. Th thank you. It really is. Yeah, I got. I'm I'm getting a few uh, publishers coming right out, and it is it's amazing coming right out and saying, "I love this. I don't see how I can make any money." Yeah, that's uh, how I, uh, I can make yeah. it. I mean, there were, there's been three of them now who have just openly said, I don't know how to market this, you know. Jane, we've been there, haven't we? Oh, good, yeah. <laughs> it maybe it's, it's wonderful because, stuff, Barry. Nobody, it's just because nobody knows Barry Dixon yet. Yeah, oh, Barry who? No. <laughs> Barry who? <laughs> That's right. Just takes... It could be Barry that. <laughs> oh, yeah. That Barry. <laughs> that Barry. Yeah. <laughs> And that's a great piece. That's yeah. a, it's and it's very, you know, 1955, but it's just as timely today and just as uh, potent and meaningful today. Maybe more so. I yeah. think so. I think so. Yeah, that's true. Very true. Sadly true. Sadly true. My first lesson in marketing came from the New York Times when I was starting to write my first novel. Um, all of us were. 
and I'll just be brief. And it was basically a guy came out with a novel that was published you know, by a traditional publisher who bought a great big low rider with a big trunk and drove across country with loads of books and just did reading after reading after reading. And that was marketing, is marketing still hmm. with some changes probably because the price of gas. Well, get yourself a truck, get yourself a truck, Barry. <laughs> I think Miho could load them on the, on the bobcat. She's learned how to drive, That's so she'll true. Try, she'll, she can load it. Yes. Miho Kidas, she'll Miho load it in your truck. <laughs> well, Estelle, let's stick with you. Uh, our okay. next group will be Estelle, then Denise, then Brad, and then we'll get to Casey, who is currently off camera, but will be back by then. So, the floor is yours, Estelle. Thank you. This is part of a memoir um, that piece. I'm just doing memoir sections as I, as they come to me. I'm not um, into chapters at this point. This is just an incident that happened. I believe I read here, John Popham makes me cry or made me cry, which was where I had a meeting with an editor of the Chattanooga Times and um, he made me cry with all of this talk about how to be, uh, um, how important journalists were. And uh, I, and now graduated from college and my first job is at United Press International in Atlanta. First professional job, obviously I've done things to put myself through school um, in Chicago and other places after I left St. Mary's, which is where I got my degree from. But here's voting in Georgia. Most of my experience at UPI was in the office as we gathered stories from stringers, local newsmen around the state, edited and checked, and relayed information from the Georgia Bureau to the regional desk across from. That editor made decisions about sending it on. The A wire, the B wire, stories of such importance they had to go immediately to New York for inclusion in the day's news, in newspapers, television networks, media all over the world. We had those kinds of events when Dr. King was campaigning on behalf of Memphis garbage workers. When he was killed, that was a wire. In fact, at that time, we had UPI journalists from New York fly in and cover news on the ground while we handled more of the local news around King's funeral. For instance, monitoring police radios for crime or outbreaks of violence at that time. Even though riots broke out in major cities like Detroit, Chicago, and Washington, DC, there were none in Atlanta and I'd learn why many years later. In fall 1968, right after Dr. King and Bobby Kennedy were killed, there was a race going on for US Senate to unseat the powerful Herman Talmadge. In a first for modern times, Maynard Jackson, a black man was running for US Senate. I volunteered a little bit for his campaign and I had a bumper sticker that proclaimed Maynard Jackson for US Senate. I was in the office on a Tuesday, Democratic primary day, all of a sudden, and I never said I'm in the Atlanta Bureau, but you know, I hope you knew that. Um, I was in the office on a Tuesday, Democratic primary day. All of a sudden I was told, you need to go down to Swainsboro, Georgia. The Speaker of the House of Representatives is running for reelection for his legislative seat and a millionaire in town is challenging him. We need to cover his election. George L. Smith was a very powerful person. He'd been Speaker for about 20 years. He was in danger of saying goodbye to his significant power in Georgia politics if he lost. So it was big news. It just so happened that that day at work, I wore a jewel red two-piece sleeveless dress, something that I'd more likely wear to church, but I wasn't going to church much in those days. Um, a hemline above the knee, not a mini skirt. My car was a red Carmen Ghia. My office was overlooking I-75 in Atlanta and Swainsboro was down near Savannah. So I had to leave immediately, no time to change. As soon as I stopped for coffee in Griffin, I knew I was out of place in that red dress, the red foreign car, and the red, white, and blue Maynard Jackson sticker on the car. Foreign cars weren't that prevalent. Assembly lines turned out thousands of General Motors and Ford products in Georgia. And the massive numbers of Northerners traveling I-75 South still drove their Detroit gas guzzlers. The 1970 oil embargo hadn't thrown the hurrying Ohio, Pennsylvania, and New York vacationers into the Toyotas as it did dramatically during the oil crisis. Interstate 16 was complete only a part of the way from Macon, so it was back roads for a while. I-16 ended where the state highway department head lived in Soperton. 
when I got to Swainsboro, a good three hours at lunch in the afternoon, people were gathered all around the courthouse. Apparently, it was a thing to do to watch everybody would come into town and come into the courthouse, the world everywhere, watch the talk board where the votes from precincts were being tallied. There weren't many black people there, although they were, they were a good portion of the population. It was mostly a whites only crowd. I wasn't on the street very long until I ran into a local station, radio station person who immediately asked where I was staying in a way that made it clear he was interested in where I was spending the night, not my news reporting job. Often the radio personality on air in these towns was a disc jockey, news person, advertising reader, the whole show. We called them rip and read guys, as that's what they did with copy pouring into their stations on our teletype printers. Then I saw Bob Cohn and his buddy, two reporters from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution papers, whom I knew from press conferences and I trusted closer to them. So me and my above address walked around the streets of Swains covering the, some of the activity was taking place in George Smith's offices up above a local bank. The speaker was also the local county attorney, a man of many hats. Some of the reports I filed on my phone back to Atlanta were heard over the radio, which was playing in the room. It looked like the millionaire was doing a little bit of damage and I didn't hide that. That report came across as I'm sitting with George and his family, his entourage in his headquarters. I get these dagger looks and loud statements from his wife and family that they don't appreciate media not being nice to George. It was a little unusual. At another point, I'm in a local cafe with those old chrome and plastic chairs and tables and the police chief pulls his large uniform body up to a table close by. The biggest product out of Swainsboro at the time is hogs, as far as I could learn, probably lumber as well. The chief resembles a pig. He's bald, fair skinned, pink from the sun, and he's got little sprigs of blonde hair sticking out of his head. I feel afraid. He looks scary, intimidating, and he definitely resembles the, por the porcine products that more than a regular person. As that gets late, long after polls have closed, it's clear everyone will continue staying at the courthouse to count the votes. I'm back upstairs in George Smith's large room and people are starting to adjourn. George shows concern for me and asks if I know how to get where I'm staying. By that time, I'm grateful as he has been nothing but courteous to me, even if I do not report the most glowing news. He offers to follow me so I can get to the place, which is out, of out from town. He trails me to this well-worn motel and leaves. I'm still scared. These people, especially the chief, give me the creeps. The lock on the door doesn't work. The Venetian blinds are crooked, barely covering the window. It's too late to get another place. For eight years, I've been taking my contacts out every night before bed, washing them, storing them, putting them in the next morning. This night, I sleep in my contact lenses, so I'll have no surprises I can't see. I wedge a chair against the door. I do sleep, but it's not a comfortable night. The next morning, I check on the results and they are still not final. I drive back to Atlanta and on the way, call again to officials in Swainsboro. They still are not in. I write a daily that mentions the lack of a Holiday Inn within 200 miles and the editor strikes that part. Later, the results will be in. George L. Smith won by a strong margin. The UPI story will be finished by the editor checking with the county officials as I will be driving still. Voting in Georgia it was an intimidating process for me. It was Maynard Jackson's first large election. He didn't win, but he did well in Atlanta. He went on to become Atlanta's first black mayor, remaking the way large contracts, such as those at the Atlanta airport, were awarded to legally include minorities. His influence has been felt around the country in contracting business of every large metro area since. For many years, I didn't think much about Swainsboro other than to see it as an exit on the way to Savannah, a remote town a distance even from Interstate 16 when that highway was finally completed. More than 36 years after my time at UPI, I went to visit my cousin and her husband who lived in Swainsboro. Retired as a high school math teacher, Ginger had made a major contribution to the historical information of the county, documenting for display in the library the service story and pictures of every World War II veteran she could find in the Swainsboro area. Since the community now boasted not just East Georgia College, where her husband was a math professor, but Southeast Technical College and a town of retirees taking up residence here, it was no longer a backward city. In fact, I was hosted at a luncheon and I gave a talk arranged by the local friends of the library 
and they purchased my then novel, my then new novel, Abbeville Farewell, um, a novel of early Atlanta and North Georgia with enthusiasm. It was held at a beautifully restored Victorian home restaurant and we were treated to a tour of a private large personal library of a wealthy community donor. Later, I wondered if this gentleman was the millionaire who challenged Speaker Smith, but I never found out. So that's it. Interesting. Oh. Very interesting. Great Thank stories, you. Estelle. Georgia politics. Oh, yeah. Georgia, Georgia voting trend. <laughs> Hello. Still going on. Still going on. He, he was mayor during the Atlanta Olympics, wasn't he? He, he was um, instrumental in getting the Olympics there. Oh. He was the one that made the announcement. And he's the one who's going like this when the announcement's made. He's, he's a tremendous size guy. He, yeah. um, he died at National Airport as he was going to lobby for something in, in Congress um, and oh. was, died in an Arlington hospital. Oh my but he, he was, um, I actually worked in his administration. I was head of the Bicentennial Commission when I was coming out of my motherhood of my staying at home with my daughter. I was the head of the Atlanta Bicentennial Commission. So I was kind of in his circle. It was in his office area. Um, and to, made inroads, he um, unseated Sam Massell, who was the Jewish mayor of Atlanta, but he was the incumbent, so I unseated him pretty well. He made a lot of, a lot of impacts on um, the businesses in Atlanta, uh, particularly, especially minority. Uh, I liked him personally. He was a, he was a cool guy. Thank you for listening. I appreciate it. Thank great. you, Estelle. Enjoyed Thank that. you so much. Very much. Denise, are you ready? I'm ready. I have two pieces. Um, I, like Barry, write mostly poetry and some micro memoirs, if you will. And um, I was looking for a piece that spoke to um, the time of year that might be reminiscent of October. And I chose a piece that is uh, about the spring instead, but it's called Spring Rubbings in an Abandoned Cemetery. So maybe you have a little October ask in there. As I pass through the gate, no sign of despair, squirrels and bluebirds welcome me there. Solitude beckons with azaleas in bloom and a patch of wild rosemary gifting perfume. Unsigned sculptures strewn through the trees like gardenia shrubs and in forest debris. Singular masterworks caught in relief, an outdoor museum with a sorrow motif. The beauty of angels with grieved, aching faces, sweet feathered wings and gowns made of laces and roses so perfect their scent seems to rise as they soften the granite, hard edges disguise, chiseled exactly, though weathered through ages like rocks in the river where white water rages. From one to the next, the right image I seek, a draped urn or sweet lamb or symbol unique. Then paper and charcoal are pulled from my bag along with a scrub brush, water and rag. The grime of the winter is washed from the stone, a century of winters if truth could be known. I tape the white paper across a bouquet while the pedestaled cherub across the way surveys my work as if questioning why, why disturb peace in this place where we lie? At this very moment, I'm not sure myself, will the rubbing be framed to sit on my shelf or transformed to a needlepoint cushion or mat? Will it grace my side table where grandmother sat? Soft charcoal converts my fingers to black as it captures each stroke texture and crack. The wrapping and ribbons, petals and leaves leap onto the paper which happily receives the beauty reflected in the eye of the artist and those who commissioned it done, regardless of their plan that it only should sit on this stone, but I cannot bear that it rest here alone. My treasure rolled up and placed in my sack, the sun on my face and a breeze at my back, my eyes lovingly scan this gallery of tears, Lord willing, I'll return in the spring of next year. 
Um, yes. Any comments? No? Okay. So the second one um, is more recent. I, I wrote it recently and it was intended to be a poem. It came from a, um, it came from a prompt about writing something about a favorite toy without naming the toy or mentioning what it was. And um, I think it's landed as more of a micro memoir. It's called Yeller. I was seven when I received him, jointed neck, arms and legs, glass eyes and muddy yellow fur, worn thin in places from long past nose boops and belly rubs. I called him Yeller. 21 years before, grandfather brought him to Aunt Doris, my mother's identical twin, as she struggled for breath in the hospital, dying. She was also seven at the time. Yeller calmed me at first sight. His serene expression offered peace, as did the story of love he carried. It was as if he knew his purpose would soon be fulfilled again. Mother's memory of Doris were dim, clouded by years or anguish or both. I grieved my aunt's loss as if it just happened, deprived of having my amazing mother times two. Thereafter, Yeller sat on my bed watching over me, my guardian angel, my playmate, the spirit of my favorite, my only aunt. If mom was too busy and I needed consoling, Yeller and I held each other, comfort settling over us as a soft blanket in winter. He heard my sobs, listened as I prayed, and understood my childish fears. In my young heart, I knew Doris herself gave him life. Grown, I continued to protect him as he had protected me. I knew the value the world would place on this precious mohair gift. The ear with the small split in the seam may once have carried the sought after button, but his value far exceeds that. Yeller, some grainy photographs and my aunt's tombstone are the only relics of her life. Blessed, I am the keeper of all three, as her sweet spirit still keeps me. Oh, wow. Oh, wonderful. That's good. Terrific. Very nice. You killed, you killed it on that one. Let's see. Yeah. Oh, oh wow. wow. See it there. So I do have oh yellow. Oh, my gosh. Yeller. Wow. Beautiful. That is wonderful. The way you yeah. weave in yeah. her loss and, and your feelings and the, the way the, um, the yeah. teddy bear comforts you is just beautiful. Yeah, that was I, beautiful. I've always felt that way about him. So when given a chance to talk about my favorite childhood toy, mm. it was yellow. There was no, no question. Beautiful detail. I have to ask how you felt at seven receiving something from a, a person who had passed away. Did you immediately feel... Oh, this is really wonderful. I miss yes. my aunt. Yes, because um, I adore my mother. Now, my mother is 90, has dementia, is in a nursing home, is not doing well uh, right now. But I have always adored my mother. And I thought how wonderful an identical twin would have been to my mother to have two of them. And, um, and this bear was just so precious. Of course, in my family, family had always been precious. And the family stories right back to 10th great grandma, <laughs> Rebecca Nurse, have been really powerful, a part of my history. And so I didn't at all feel that. I felt, I felt honored to be trusted with the only thing that anybody had, Aunt Doris. So yeah, it was a good thing. I was curious because my granddaughter was five when she became really aware that she was, her middle name was for me. A past away relative. But now at seven, she's she's embracing it. But at five, it was a little scary for her. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you for let me letting me share. That was lovely. Thank you for doing it. Beautiful. Such a Beautiful tapestry of emotion in, in both pieces. Really wonderful. Thank you. Brad, 
Are you ready for us? Well, I don't know, Jonathan. I, I really feel I need to apologize ahead of time reading this for taking this beautiful tapestry emotion right down the crapper here with my work. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I apologize ahead of time. <laughs> I have a short story that I've written. Uh, I think I think uh, it comes from some recent events and a really whacked out sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, I'm glad to hear Niles use ass in his story. I was so concerned I might be the first one to use that tonight or maybe ever. <laughs> because the title of my uh, story is One Asshole at a Time. I hope it's okay to use asshole, Jonathan, since I already did. Story of my life. <laughs> <laughs> okay. One asshole at a time. <clears throat> she duct taped me to a chair, gagged me, and read Deepak Chopra books in my face for 12 hours. We shrieked <laughs> through the phone. Said she cut off my bleep, censored with a doll steak knife if I ever called her that again or used the f-bomb again I can't repeat the words she's as strong as a machine press and has a creepy awareness of everything I say and do Albert muted the phone jotted a couple notes while Wade continued his rampage she took down my confederate flag pulled that damn flag pole right out of the ground ripped my David Duke for Congress poster off the wall Turn my proud boy's leather vest into a bullwhip. So what'd you call her, Albert asked. Well, I might have called her the B word, you know, the F-bombing B word. You gotta get her out of here. Albert calmly looked at the phone with a wry smile. That's our Lucy. Another sign it's working, he thought. Dr. Albert Gal Galilei was CEO and research director of Humanitai, the company he founded. The I Love Lucy project was critical to the Manatai mission. Lucy will change the world, he believed. Wade, you know I can't extract Lucy until your contract is up, Albert replied. The best advice I can give you is never call her that again. And if you want to save your man in this, no F-bombs. <laughs> the contract also stated clearly that Lucy would provide everything I needed, Wade pleaded. It all started out so well, what's happening? Wade was a certified asshole. Albert knew because he had conducted the certification, a screening process critical to the I Love Lucy project. Humanitai specialized in the ideal mate for men who hate, can't relate, or get no date, as a catchy <laughs> late night infomercial jingle goes, an innovative recruiting tactic for the project. It would have been easy to tap into the wealth of warped pricks in the population, but Dr. Albert Galilei wanted only the most vile, wanton, and shameless degenerates for certification. Wade eventually transitioned from certified asshole to an attorney for the ACLU and a popular ranking <laughs> master. I know this because I was also a certified asshole in the project, one of the first and worst. I know this because Albert finally told me. <clears throat> I'm Ronnie. Will you know me as R, the mysterious, mysterious R behind the R Annan movement that mobilized millions of like minded assholes to take up arms and fight for our country? It all became clear to me as I read Horton Hears a Who in my GED English class. <clears throat> The famous children's author, Dr. Seuss, was an evil, deranged, but brilliant radical insurrectionist. While professing peace, love, and acceptance, his books has been secretly subversive, corrupting the minds of a generation of avid young readers. His dystopian worlds of green eggs and ham, the cat in the hat, and the Grinch who stole Christmas had corrupted a generation of impressive, impressionable youth who are now in powerful, leadership positions, attempting to take over our country and turn it into a Whoville wasteland. The sexual deviation of these leaders instilled by Seuss's books like Hop on Pop and The Pocketbook of Boners was taking America down a Sneetch's shithole. I was determined to stop them. 
I did it all through social media from the confines of my childhood room at my parents' house. <laughs> it got pretty lonely in that puny room alone in many days at a time. On one of those late, late lonely nights, the Humanitai infomercial caught my attention. I was quickly certified and signed the contract that brought a Lucy to me. She was everything I wanted at first, everything I needed eventually. Redeemed, re-educated, and now a published poet and staff writer for Better Bots and Humanoids, I was the first reporter to be allowed within the fortress of security that protected the mysterious Humanitai Research Laboratory. Rumors had swirled throughout the machine learning community that Dr. Albert Galilei had pioneered the Buddha dimensionality induction, a heuristic neural network precipitating exploratory unsupervised morality learning. I'll never forget walking into Dr. Galilei's office for the first time. I saw a sign in his wall that succinctly told my own story and became the heart of the asshole story I would tell the world. Humanity, making the world better, one asshole at a time. <laughs> now that's Imagine. naked realism. That's naked realism. <laughs> there it is. That's naked realism. That's it. Now we understand. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, Thank you, Brad. Yeah, you're, uh, <laughs> I'm sure you're, you and the audience are quite well. What a shame that Millie had to leave early. What a <laughs> yeah, she loved that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. That is funny. Thank you, Brad. That was great. Wow. Where are you going to submit that, Brad? I yeah. want to know. <laughs> Well, I, 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 I was afraid to even read it here, let alone submit it anyway. <laughs> I'm sure there's a publication out there. No, you, should, you should most definitely submit that. Talk to Niles. He knows where Seriously, all the, really? all I, the I, I, are. I've never yeah, done there's, that. There's plenty of places that would take that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, the tone reminds me of uh, my radio show co-host Rex Hurst. He writes horror novels and he writes um, science fiction and that sort of thing. And your tone very much sounds like his, where he'll come in and he'll deliver these stories that are so scathingly brutal. And it's just like, just like this nice, even tone. Like, it sounds like everything he's saying is perfectly acceptable stuff. And all of us are like, what? <laughs> 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 really well done. Really Thank well you. done, Brad. <laughs> I don't know where it came from. Really, I'm not like that, actually. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it's fiction. It got here. <laughs> yeah. It arrived. Thank it you. Arrived. Right. It got shared. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, gang, that brings us to our headliner. And I'm very happy to welcome, welcome Casey back. Uh, for those of you familiar with the legends and lore of Open Mic Night, you might remember that it actually began because of Casey and our dear friend Vivian in uh, the long ago time of 2019, I believe, when South Carolina Writers Association and our Conroy Literary Festival partnered together. And so it's all the more special to have Casey back with us tonight. Casey is the host of the radio show Right on SC. And she is the author of two novels, After December, which was a finalist for the National Indie Excellence Award in 2020. And her second novel, Before Pittsburgh, was released earlier this year. When she is not gluing together jigsaw puzzles with her daughter, she is receiving the 2021 Fresh Voices in the Humanities Award from South Carolina Humanities. And she's also taught workshops, including for us at the Conroy Center and also for SCWA. Uh, our, our long ago friend, the South Carolina Book Festival, Winter Wheat Festival, and the Fairfax County Public Library. And uh, I said it on the radio one time, so it must be true. Casey is my bestie. That's right. <laughs> and she reminds me all the time when she tells me what new favor I'm going to do for her. Yes. I actually write the emails, dear bestie. <laughs> So welcome, Casey. Welcome back. 
Thank you, Jonathan. I appreciate you. Um, so uh, in 2019, when we went to publish after December, uh, my publisher said, well, she's a good friend and she was excited to do the project. And I said, I don't know if this book is ready. Let me send it to somebody who I know will tell me it's total garbage, uh, if, it, if, if, if in fact it's total garbage. And that email read, Dear Bestie, <laughs> here's this book I'm thinking about publishing. Please tell me the truth, whether I'll be embarrassed if I do so. And uh, we, I just about wrecked the car when I got the email back from him. And like, I, when I realized he had finished it and he sent it back and I like pulled off the interstate so that I could read the email. And he said to me, so many sandwiches, Casey, everybody's eating sandwiches in this book. <laughs> so anyhow. Thank you, Jonathan, for making After December what it was, uh, what it is, I guess, is the best way to put that. Uh, and I wasn't sure of the rules. So I went and prepared. I've got five different pieces. They're all in the three to four minute range. But of course, I won't read them all because I don't want to keep you guys here all night. But I thought what I'd start with is a is a classic, but it's got a lot of F-bombs in it. So then I thought maybe that's not the right thing to do. Um, so I want to start with one that just won the... Uh, the for fall lines magazine um it's a short story called the shower and it just won the broad river prize for po for prose and this is a jasper project uh operation out of columbia south carolina and fall lines is their publication that is going to be released in january so it's called the shower and it's about a woman who goes to her baby shower and uh, while she's there gets a little bit distracted uh, by the bathroom tiles so when I excuse myself to the bathroom, our hostess, a distant cousin, directs me to her own master bathroom, and it's there in all my seven months pregnancy, pink and orange maternity top, no mimosa having misery, that I see the tiles, small and square and blue, and have an epic flashback, the kind that would drop me to my knees if I knew I could get back up again. The flashback isn't grief. It's not dignified loss or pain like a death, a miscarriage, a tragedy. It's not a horrific secret like abuse or violence. This flashback makes my panties a little wet, makes me grin and turn away from the image of who I am and close my eyes looking for who I was. This flashback is one of those memories I knew even at the time I would carry with me. It's us in the bathroom. It's a secret. And it was a long time ago. Nothing about now resembles then. Now has an audience. I unwrap an awkward monstrosity. It's a plastic tub with soap and washcloths and towels and a net to hold the baby. I rub my belly. There's a baby in there. I unwrap a music box that plays You Are My Sunshine. It reminds me of a gift I got once from a high school boyfriend. Not you, a different one. Except that music box was a globe with a wizard inside and glittery dust that floated around and it played music of the night. It had moons and stars painted on the base, like the ones on my tattoo, the tattoo I got after you. I unwrap a rectangle, it's a frame. Inside is a picture of my mom holding a baby, probably me. I look up and she's smiling at me, tears glistening in her eyes. Emotions surge within me and I smile back and put the frame aside. Blankets and towels and washcloths and tiny pink dresses and onesies and pacifiers and bottles, lots of bottles and nipples, lots of nipples. I unwrap and smile and thank the room. I read cards and spell names for my aunt who is recording all of the from whom's and what's givens. When I say thank you, the announce lady raises her mimosa so I can identify her. I want a mimosa. Another thank you, another raised glass and I smile. I would give anything to be somewhere else. At first, I only told my college roommate. She confessed she hadn't been with anyone. She had a longtime boyfriend and they never felt ready. I told her I'd gotten past that with my sophomore year boyfriend, not you, music box guy. By the time senior year came around, I'd had half a dozen lovers, each one better than the last as I learned what I liked. There's a fervency and secrecy to high school trysts that cannot be replicated. Certainly not in college where everyone can and does get laid. When I told my roommate about you, she was scandalized by the publicness of those mornings. But they weren't public, were they? The door locked with a click and the guard office was usually empty. Then the water provided noise and we were quiet, weren't we? 
my swimsuit zipped up the back to my neck and you'd pull that zipper down slowly, your breath on my shoulder, push your hands under the material and shove it down my shoulders, pinning my arms to my side, kiss my neck, my wet hair and that chlorinated water, press yourself against me, your suit too small to contain you. Libby, hmm, are you listening? Mrs. James, just ask you a question. I'm sorry, mother. I wondered what you plan to name the baby. Mrs. James has a pinched look of disapproval and I smirk thinking what her expression would be if she had seen what I was remembering. <laughs> Just a little bit of a little bit of a racy story. <laughs> oh, I love it. Great. The least, the least racy part of the story. <laughs> yeah, this is great stuff. I told you guys I have a romance Where addiction. It's playing oh, itself yeah. out. <laughs> The dichotomy was fabulous. Just the, the, the dichotomy between her inside and the interior thoughts and, and the exterior scene. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I, I'm really proud of that story. It's a, um, and I was really excited that it that it was selected for that prize and, and for fall lines. I think people are going to like it. And this the baby shower is man the the symbols for. But it was really funny because my husband he's like you can't let your mom or my mom read that story. They're going to know that's your baby shower. <laughs> <laughs> I did from the kids. <laughs> fiction. It's all fiction. The sure way to yeah, hire right. your mother in law is to have it published. That's right. That's Good right. Good job. <laughs> um, you know, she, she, she won't, I, I doubt she'll read it. I think my mom might be watching the Facebook Live right now, though. So, oops. <laughs> um, Okay, uh, then the other piece I thought I would share with you guys is, because uh, I haven't done this one before either, is a vampire story. That yeah. seems relevant, yeah. So now something completely different, um, a vampire story. So our, our, the narrator for the vampire novel is a, a male character. So I don't know if you can imagine my deep Demi Moore voice being a male character, but his name is Blue. And uh, through most of the novel, it's a first person perspective, but there's these flashbacks and the flashbacks are done in third person. So hopefully it will uh, be a little bit easier with the third person. Blue is uh, new to being a vampire. He's probably three or four years in um, and he's working in a strip club uh, where he finds uh, one of the strippers is in distress and decides to rescue her by taking her home with him. So it was near midnight when Dahlia and Blue entered the condo on the top floor of Park Towers. He carried her into the bathroom and ran the shower. The room filled with steam and Blue set Dahlia down long enough to shed his jacket, untie the bikini top and rip what was left of the bottoms off her hips. Then he held her again, naked in his arms and stepped into the shower stream. She hissed as the water made contact with her bruised skin. As the blood washed away, Blue could see where her flesh was torn and swollen. Her attacker had made it a point to beat the softest parts of her. She was skinny, hip bones jutting out and rib bones visible, but her breasts were large and round and her legs strong. When her feet hit the floor of the shower, Blue kept his hands on her waist to stabilize her. She bent at the knee and cupped water in her hands to splash between her legs. The water ran red around her bare feet and Blue's black boots. After she'd rinsed clean, Blue lathered shampoo into her hair and she leaned back against him, letting his fingers massage her scalp and wash the golden strands clean. Ripping a fang across his own wrist, he pressed the bloody gash to her mouth. Drink this, he said, it will heal you. She looked up at him, watery blue eyes wide with confusion. Trust me, Dahlia, he said. She took Blue's wrist with soft lips and slurped at it, nursing like an infant to its mother's breast, closing her eyes. He smoothed her hair down her back and felt the drawing away of some of the magic that sung in his veins. When the heat of the exchange made him dizzy, he broke contact and she turned her face to the shower stream and rinsed her mouth. A thick fluffy towel wrapped around her damp and damp and shivering, Dahlia let Blue carry her into his bedroom and tuck her between the sheets. Burrowing into the pillow, she sighed deeply. The bruises on her face were already healing and Blue could sense the surging magic in her. You're some kind of angel, she whispered. Thank you. Hardly, he said. Where are we? This is my home, mine and Raven's. Raven? As if summoned, he appeared in the doorway. What's this? He asked, moving cautiously forward. Though Dahlia's blood scent was less now, it was still strong. Raven's eyes pulsed and glowed silver from across the room. One of the dancers from Sabrina's, Blue said. Evidently, her boyfriend didn't want the baby she was carrying. A sob from the bed. Blue reached down and held Dahlia's hand. 
It's okay, sweet girl, he cooed. You're better off without it. She turned her face into the pillow and her shoulders shook with sobs. Blue looked up at Raven. His face had gone pale and his eyes widened. He looked frozen. You healed her. It wasn't a question. I tried. Have you ever done that before? Blue shook his head. What made you do it? Blue shrugged. Instinct? You told me when the thoughts come to follow where they lead. And your thoughts said, feed her your blood? Dahlia shifted some, her hand still clasped in Blue's. He felt a kind of warmth where their skin met. Blue couldn't explain what he'd heard. It wasn't words exactly. It was more like the impulse of a mother to nurse or an animal to protect. He felt protective of her. Had they still been at the club, he would have killed the man responsible for this. As it was, once she was asleep, Blue meant to find him and make him pay. But the need for revenge was less than the need to heal, to nurture, and strongest was a sense of belonging, of connection. When he looked at Dahlia, he felt a surge of love. Blessed Ileana, Blue said, and grinned at Raven. His face still showed shock. Blue squeezed Dahlia's hand, heard her murmur against the pillow. She was falling asleep. Raven came closer. Blue could feel him there now, too. His sire's presence was usually the strongest in the room, but it took him getting within a few feet before Raven's presence overcame Dahlia's weight within Blue. I've never healed anyone, Raven confessed. I imagine it must have some effect. I feel peaceful and connected, grounded, almost. Grounded, Raven echoed. Then he looked down at Dahlia and Blue felt his entire body seize. He pushed Blue out of the way and fell to his knees beside her. By the brides, he said, where did you find her? At Sabrina's, Blue said, confusion now eating at the peacefulness he'd felt before. Do you know her? Of course I know her. Raven turned her hand over and lay his cheek in her palm. She's my wife. Oh, oh. <laughs> Whoa, whoa, whoa. Wow. Wow, what a twist. <laughs> yeah, that was wonderful. Vampires for your October oh, Halloween. <laughs> wow, what a twist. Vampires and strip clubs. What a <laughs> man, they love it there. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, great. They love it there. I have truly had a wonderful, interesting diversity of topics tonight and oh, guess um, that, blew me away. that was fabulous that was, yeah. i'm glad you liked it i i've read i think i've read i don't think i've read them here before but i've read vampires before um there's a great scene where blue is turned into a vampire i've taken that to open mic before um, and then i think the last time i came to your open mic i read something from the neverland story which is in the wadi awards now by the way if you're not published on wattpad I don't know that you should publish on Wattpad, but it's a great place to go. <laughs> they have a lot of really cool fan fiction there. And um, I put up a, a YA uh, Neverland story there. So um, what do I got, Jonathan? One more, two more. One more. We can do two more. Sure. Let's do two more. Why not? Okay. We're just making up the rules as we go along anyway. So let's <laughs> make the two more rule right now. All right. Well, now that we are in our, um, you know, it's the eight o'clock hour, so I'll be careful with the F-bombs, uh, but there's at least one that has to stay in this particular passage. So this is from um, After December. The story about After December is Brian is uh, this 22-year-old kind of, he's a real jerk, quite frankly. Uh, it's all first person from his perspective, and his best friend commits suicide, and Brian has to go home for the weekend uh, to, to deal with this. And the last time he had been home was Christmas break and he left a lot of potholes and explosions in December. He had intentionally blown up the relationships and then he had fled to California uh, for school and then he has to come back just six weeks later. And so he's not really ready to be there. Um, so in this scene, it's Friday and it's the day of his Tony's funeral. And he has this flashback as he's getting ready to take a shower and get ready to go to Tony's house. So we get to see Brian and Tony together. So you look like shit, Tony had said. Thanks, Dick, I'd replied. Did your brother, did you bother to sleep? Yes, sort of. I yawned and could still smell the foulness of my own breath. Get a shower. I want to take you somewhere. I blinked several times into the mirror image, my bedroom, my parents' house. Trying to push the memory away, I walked out of the room, into the bathroom, and stepped into the shower. Tired, still a little bit drunk, and wishing I had about three more hours to sleep. The water felt good on my skin, warm and clean. It washed away the sweat from the night before, reckless sleep and fitful dreams. Where are we going? We were riding along Route 7 toward Leesburg in his dad's car. 
Tony let the radio play, the old East station, and neither of us smoked. We'd stopped into 7-Eleven and gotten two bottles of water and two cherry Coke Slurpees. I found this place last spring and it's amazing. I wanted to come back once the leaves have changed, he said. And I'm going to share it with you, he grinned. Gee, thanks. It was Thanksgiving break and I'd come home the Saturday before the holiday week. It was my third year away, and last night we'd all been in Tony's basement getting drunk and playing cards until the twins left and Tony and Casey and Chris and I got high. Casey'd taken me home, we'd messed around in my parents' driveway, but I'd been too stoned for sex. I staggered inside and up the stairs around 4 a.m. Now it was 10.30, and Tony had kidnapped me for some mission out to Leesburg. He drove for a while, and at one point I thought I was going to throw up, and then it passed, and then it happened again, and we still weren't there. Then he turned off the road onto a gravel drive and we followed that slowly for a while as it wound its way up into the mountains. At the top, a crumbling stone wall and a tiny white wooden church. There were no cars, which was weird because it was Sunday, but there was no sign either and I realized it must be abandoned. Tony was parking the car and then turning off the engine and getting out. I opened my own door and stepped out, looked up at the steeple. I could see, now that we were closer, where the boards had broken and the paint was peeling, and there was moss and mold growing on the corners and the windows. Look, Tony said. I'm looking. No, he said, over here. I backed up a bit, still watching the church, taking in the details of its decay and decimation, wondering about the people who'd once worshipped here, got married here, had funerals here. I surveyed the lawn full of weeds and grave markers that had toppled over and crumbled. <clears throat> a sidewalk ran down the middle from the front door to the road. I followed it, turning back toward Tony. He was standing on the top of the wall that separated the churchyard from the road. I walked up behind him, put one foot on the wall, made sure it was stable, and then climbed up beside him. Holy shit, I said. In front of us was a break in the tree line, maybe 50 yards wide, and beyond that, the deepest valley I'd ever seen. It was blanketed on both sides with trees dyed all the colors of autumn, gold, amber, auburn, crimson. The trees rolled down the hill in front of us and up the hill on the other side. It was a massive rainbow of leaves and branches like I'd never seen before and have never seen since. Tony and I stood there quietly, watching the sunlight pour down from the early noon sky and bathe the valley in warmth. The chill of fall slipped past us, and I shoved my hands in the pockets of my coat. Fucking magnificent, Tony had said. It looks like it's burning. Told you, the one has to stay. Like, you got to leave the one in there, right? Yeah, that's all right. Yeah. I may have omitted, omitted a few others. <laughs> Brian is not a very gentle narrator. There's a lot of cursing in that book. <laughs> <laughs> a tremendous amount of cursing in that book, as a matter of fact. Okay. <laughs> so, so what we get from after December is five days, like the worst five days of Brian's life, right? He, uh, he's there, his best friend has died. He's having to repair all these broken relationships. Um, he misbehaves. He's a real jerk, right? The very last chapter of that book takes place in Pittsburgh three years later. And when we get to that chapter, like spoiler alert, Brian has grown up, things have gotten better, right? He's in a, in, a, in a better condition. And so I thought the book was over, like we're done with Brian, let's, you know, off to the races and be done with it. Um, and I thought that Pittsburgh chapter sort of served as like an epilogue. And uh, my readers wanted to know what had happened in the three years. So how was he able to recover from this? Um, how is it that his friends still welcomed him back and cared about him? How is it that, um, that anyway, that these things had been mended? And so that's where Before Pittsburgh comes in. So Before Pittsburgh, interestingly, I got to write it during COVID and Brian is isolated from his friends. He is broken, he's grieving. Um, and all of those things felt so, relevant during COVID um, that it, I think it turned out pretty well. So this is a fun scene. Um, what happens in Pittsburgh is that the guys all get back together. Brian and all of his friends get back together. Um, actually, you know what? This is a Nashville scene. I'm going to, I'm going to read the Nashville student said um, Brian's got one friend that is African-American. And at one point during their three year, this three year time period, they all go to Nashville together. So that's the scene I'm going to read now. So Ever been to Nashville, Jason asked. It's a party every night. Let's go find some live music. 
We wrote the name of the bar we would be in on a pad of paper on the desk and headed out. Joel stopped at the front desk and gave the clerk a message and a key for Chris. We were three rounds and two hours in when he finally caught up with us. You couldn't wait for me, was the first thing he said to Joel. Sorry, dude, Joel said. I was done working and needed a beer. We occupied a patio table and a beer garden style alley bar. Jason stood and clapped Chris's shoulder, but Chris shrugged him off. Man, it's cool, Jason said. Nah, man, it's not cool, Chris said. First thing the clerk wanted was my ID to prove I was the friend you were expecting. What? Jason glanced at Joel. Yeah, Chris continued. It's only fun when the manager comes around and suggests we speak away from the desk so the other guests aren't disturbed. He leaned both hands on the back of the chair and I could see he was shaking. I stood too. What the F, man? Yeah, well, it's not exactly natural, he sneered, for a guy who looks like me to be going to a hotel room that belongs to guys who look like you. What the hell, man? Joel asked. Who said that? They didn't have to say it, Chris gritted his teeth, but you got it sorted out. Joel raised a hand to flag down the server. Chris glared at Joel. Yeah, man, I got it sorted out. Me and the manager and the security guard, we all got it sorted out. Jesus, dude, Jason said, we should have stayed. We didn't think it would be a problem. Nah, man, you wouldn't have. Chris squeezed the chair, expelled a long breath of air and seemed to be trying to calm down. The server appeared. Shots, Joel said, five of them. And Chris? What are you drinking, man? Chris flipped his hand in the air and said, Dominion. It was what I was drinking. Lager, two more, please. I pointed at my own and made eye contact with Chris. He tipped his head just slightly, the nod of assent, and said, where's the John? A few minutes later, he and I stood on the other side of the beer garden fence, and I handed him the one hitter I carried with me. He took a quick drag, held the smoke in his lungs, and said, thanks, in that tight grunt of marijuana smokers that doesn't let any of the smoke escape. Want to talk about it? I asked. Not even a little bit. Another hit from the cigarette-shaped pipe, and Chris rolled his shoulders back and shook his head. <sighs> Manager probably thought I was your dealer. Stupid. He tapped the pipe against the rail and shoved it back into the box. Handing it back to me, he said, don't ever do that shit again. We won't. Sucks, he said. Not going to be a buzzkill. Let's get over it. Two beers on the table. All weekend to misbehave, I grinned. Might even find you a girl. Chris smiled then, too. Sure, Brian. Let's go get laid. <laughs> wow you got the intensity of that that between those guys Ooh, boy, great dialogue wow yeah. great dialogue yeah. yeah thank you Perfect i worry stuff. about i worry about dialogue heavy scenes and readings because i'm not sure if i could if the inflection can tell the back and oh. forth especially because i don't you use do a lot do of dialogue tags you got it dialogue is hard and that was beautifully done yeah. thank you very 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 good Thank you. you. I appreciate y'all. Do you purposely do Demi Moore when you speak? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's this is my that's my sexy radio voice. Come on, Barry. You this is how that. I get away with being on the radio. People know me. I've had people, I, I've actually had people um, tap me on the shoulder in public places and ask me if I'm on the radio because they recognize my voice. So I guess it might be pretty distinctive. It, yeah. it, when you said it, it kind of snapped, snapped my head back how much you yeah. really do so. Yeah, it really did. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> I don't think so. In my head, oh, I don't yeah. sound like oh, that yeah. at all, you know, but I get told that a lot. So it's a great it's voice. Flat, it's flattering. Thank you. Great voice. <laughs> Good voice. I used to do, uh, in, the, in the ad biz, I used to do a lot of radio, produced and directed a lot of radio. You do have a very good voice. Appreciate that. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you, Jonathan, for letting me be a headliner. And uh, again, for reading before Pittsburgh, too, and putting up with all my profanity. <laughs> you are very welcome, Casey. Is this the end of Brian and the crew? Two books and done? Or is there a third, perhaps? Um, I feel like I'm done, but I don't know. Jason has been knocking on the door, wanting me to tell his story. So mm -hmm. we'll see. I don't think Brian has another book, um, but there may be one for Jason because he's he's got a lot of un- as Brian, in this book and before Pittsburgh, as Brian is climbing out of the hole, Jason is descending into it. Um, and so you say that he, he has delayed his grief over Tony's death. And so you start to see Jason kind of downward spiraling. Um, and the, the second time they go to Nashville, he actually gets in a fight. Uh, and so you see some, some tendencies toward addiction and violence from Jason. So he may have a book, um, but I don't know. I we'll thought see. he was setting up Chris for a book. 
I don't think I can write Chris's book. I'll be honest with you. I used sensitivity readers for, for before Pittsburgh because um, I have Chris and Brian falls in love with a woman named Jada. Uh, they spend some time with Chris's aunt, Deneen in Nashville. And because I had these three pretty strong uh, African-American characters, it was important to me that I get them right. Uh, and so I spent some time with some beta readers on uh, sensitivity beta readers for those three characters. And they all felt great about them. So hopefully that means other people will feel great about them. But I don't think I could write a, a story from Chris's perspective. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, it's just probably that story. not my story. Yeah. Yeah. But he'll definitely be in Jason's, I assure you, because he's the one that sort of jerks Jason out of the downward spiral. <laughs> so he's a good secondary character. It's All been right. a fantastic ride tonight, guys. We uh, we ran over, but it was very worth it. And I think about how far we've come from Betty White in the course of our time together. <laughs> so thank you for setting the tone for the evening right from the onset. <laughs> And thank you all so much for being here. We're happy to do this every single month in partnership with the friends at South Carolina Writers Association. And thanks to everybody out there in Facebook land and eventually on YouTube where this all ends up as well. So good night, everybody. Thank you, Jonathan. Thanks, Jonathan. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Cass Cassie.